Hey friends, take a minute to think about your pets and other familiar animals with their lovely eyes and their cute little noses in the middle of their faces. We take it for granted that this is what a face should look like with two eyes and a mouth and a nose located between them. If we were to rearrange those features, it wouldn't look so cute anymore. This is the canonical pattern. It's how we think vertebrates are supposed to look. So what are we supposed to make of this freakish creature? Two eyes, a mouth, and where's its nose? It's not where it's supposed to be. It's way up on top of its head, forming a blowhole. How the heck did that happen? And that is actually two intertwined questions. One part of the question is how that happened evolutionarily, the Evo side. Can we find fossil whales with the blowhole moved halfway up the head, for instance? We expect that the ancestor of all whales exhibited the common mammalian pattern of a nose in the middle of its face. There must have been some transition over millions of years to put the nose above its face. The second part is about development, the devil side. What goes on in dolphin embryos? Does the nose start out in front, like all mammals, and then migrate to the top of the head? The answer to the first part is yes, we do have such fossils, and we've had them for a long time. The answer to the second part is also yes, but it's really difficult to work on dolphin embryos for both practical and ethical reasons, so it's tricky to get the information. One of my motivations for putting this video together was that I recently was sent some amazing photos of developing dolphin faces by a colleague, Michael Richardson of the University of Leiden, and he gave me permission to show them here for the first time. But first, some context and some bones before I show off the embryos. So the other day I uploaded the audio for a debate I was in in 2008 a debate with a creationist who insisted that there were very few whale fossils and that they didn't show any of the diagnostic feature features of the clade. And I'll give you just a short excerpt of his specific claim. If you really want to, I'll include a link down below and you can go listen to the whole horrible 40 minutes, but I'll just give you one minute of what he said. It's not a jump from indo to modern whales. What about Pachycetus? What about Rhodocetus? You heard of those? I don't know every fossil name, but I do know. <laughs> no, no, you no, have no. just you know what? You have just announced that there are no transitional. No, no, no. I just read an article in Scientific American less than six months ago about exactly what scientists think uh, uh, the whales came from, and so whatever names were in there were the most current names at that time, and I'm sure it was a peer of your uh, stature. And they do not have they do not have anything with a blowhole on top of it. They do, not have anything with, wait, they do not have anything with fins that go up and down, which is opposite of what fish do. And now you know why I posted it. I was going to make this video, and it reminded me of that ignoramus from 10 years ago who refused to acknowledge the facts. The background image, by the way, is Basilosaurus, a late Eocene cetacean from about 40 million years ago. This is not a recent discovery. Basilosaurus fossils were found in the U.S. in the 19th century and are relatively plentiful in places like Texas, where nowadays creationists thrive. Note also that it has the features Simmons denies. Nostrils that are no longer located at the front of the snout, but have crept back partway. And also flukes that move vertically. Simmons was making the argument of a scientific illiterate. He was making a claim in 2008 that had been falsified by the discovery of specimens of whales 150 years before. So when he says he's not current on the literature, he's really not current on the literature. In the sake of completeness, I also went and searched the official scientific literature on PubMed to see what had been published in the time just before this debate in 2007. And I discovered that in 2007, there had been a number of papers published by well-known experts in this field, like Tavison and Gingrich, 
all on this subject. So th this is not a mysterious hidden subject to be pursuing. Even worse, you don't have to go to the obscure, difficult to reach scientific literature. You can just go down to your local bookstore and pick up this book, Carl Zimmer's At the Water's Edge. This was published in 1999. It lists all the species I mentioned. There are no surprises here. It's got diagrams and illustrations. It specifically shows things like the migration of the blowhole. So this is all easily read, was current in 1999. Simmons hadn't seen it in 2008, which is disgraceful. So that's why I bring it up again, because at the time even, I was filled with rage at this clown lying to his audience, just lying blatantly about the facts to the audience and further lying about his credibility and his authority in this particular field. <sighs> this information is everywhere. This is a diagram of whale skulls taken from a 1990 paper by Haining and Mead. Just look at the pair of bones labeled N and nasal bones. You can see how they drift from the front of the skull at the top towards the back of the skull at the bottom. Keep those ends in mind. I'm going to switch to a side view. So remember the nasal bones from the last slide. Uh, they're conveniently color-coded yellow in these illustrations. The nostrils are at the front end of the nasal bones and are indicated by a nice bold arrow. From the pair of fossil whales at the top to the modern whales at the bottom, you can see the nostrils move backwards over time as the nasal bones recede and the premaxilla, the blue bones, extend backwards, a phenomenon called cranial telescoping. All of these whales have the same skull bones. They've just shifted and stretched in different ways. You might be wondering if you, human, have a nasal and premaxilla bone too. Uh, reach up and touch the bridge of your nose. That's your nasal bone. Our skull bones have shifted in a different way though, and our premaxilla has shrunk rather than stretched. It's been reduced to a small bone behind your upper lip, which is completely fused with the maxilla, that is the red bone in the diagram, uh, and is now simply the bit of bone your upper incisor teeth are embedded in. It's often called the incisive bone. But there's more. We can do a cladistic analysis of other features such as the presence or size of the turbinates, the delicate whorl of thin bones in your nasal passages, which are greatly reduced in whales. It turns out that if you're aquatic and clamp your nostrils closed while swimming underwater, your olfactory system is nearly useless and gradually withers away. Whales have greatly reduced olfactory bulbs, and we can see that diminution in endocasts of fossil whales. We also see a radical decline in olfactory receptor genes in whales. The evolution of these features is clearly demonstrated in the fossil record and in molecular comparisons of extant species. What about development? What you really want to see, though, are the dolphin embryos. Uh, before I show them to you, though, I have to give credit where credit is due. These are embryos that were photographed by Michael K. Richardson of the University of Leiden from the collection of Professor Olschläger at uh, Frankfurt. These are dolphins that were caught in tuna nets, so they're basically bycatch tuna nets in California, which kill a great many dolphins every year. I have fewer ethical reservations about scientists making observations of these dead animals than I do the fact that uh, right here in my pantry I have cans of tuna. So these, these dolphins died to provide me with sandwiches, and that's what we should be more concerned about. Uh, I'll also mention that there's a price on these cans. There's a price beyond the pennies we pay for these readily available tins of tuna than is shown here, and we just have to be aware of that. I do have to say, though, it's nice to know it's it's non-GMO tuna, isn't it? 
as if there are genetically modified wild tuna swimming around out there. I'm kind of surprised it didn't mention that it's also gluten-free. This is a very young dolphin embryo. Notice the nostrils indicated by the white arrow. They're at the front of the face. You might also notice the pectoral fins, and farther back, those little bumps, those are the pelvic limbs. You might be slightly surprised by that because adult dolphins do not have pelvic limbs. These are vestigial organs that are eventually going to be lost as the organism develops. Now here's a slightly older embryo. The pigmented eye is clearly forming, and there's still a little nubbin of a pelvic limb bud. But most importantly, those nostrils are still right up in front of the face at the white arrow. Older still, and now there's no obvious pelvic limbs anymore. And look at that face! The eyes and the mouth are obvious. There are nostrils, and they're located between the mouth and the eyes. So let's take a slightly closer look. Look at that broad muzzle. This doesn't look anything like a pointy-beaked dolphin. It looks more like its distant cousin, the hippopotamus. We are not seeing much of, if any, nasal migration or telescoping of the skull. That's about to change. So older still, the face has greatly changed shape. It's become pointy and beak-shaped, as we expect from a dolphin. Those facial shape changes have led to the nostrils, or blowhole, moving way up on the head, presumably by elongation of the premaxilla and retraction of the nasal bones. Now look still later. This is a sad-looking embryonic dolphin, and who can blame it? It has an even more pronounced beak, and the blowhole is still trekking up over the cranium. Compare it to that younger embryo. There have been dramatic changes in the overall shape of the skull and facial bones. On the right, we also see a close-up of the upper lip in a row of tiny bumps. They are suggestive of whisker follicles, but again, adult dolphins do not have whiskers. All right, a few conclusions that we can make from all this. First of all, we have lots of fossils illustrating the phenomenon of nasal drift, that is the movement of the nostrils from a position in the front of the face up onto the top of the skull. Are there transitional fossils showing this evolutionary process? Yes. Okay, that's, that's an absolute rock-solid conclusion we can come to. We also have plenty of specimens demonstrating the ontogeny of the blowhole. So there's lots of examples. I've shown you a few of dolphin embryos illustrating this pattern of initial appearance of nostrils at the front of the face and gradual migration back up to the top of the skull. Sort of like what we see in the evolutionary series as well. So it's a hint of recapitulation going on here. Do we know everything though? No. And there's a gigantic gap in what I showed you today. Uh, where's the link between evolution and development? What we'd really like to see is some of the molecular basis for these processes. We'd like to see, you know, for instance, what genes are involved and expansion of the premaxillary bone. We don't know that yet. It will be an interesting topic to study. However, making that link between evolution and development is not something I'd be willing to sacrifice dolphins for. This is an unfortunate mortality that's being preserved in these specimens, and we would rather avoid that in an endangered species or a species as intelligent as the dolphin. A good place to start, though, might be to look at the genes that play a role in morphogenesis of the skull in simpler, more numerous, more expendable organisms like zebrafish and mice. And that's kind of like, that's kind of where I'd like to see it go is what is controlling, what is regulating the changes in shape of the skull of vertebrates in general? And then we can go from that general information asking about the specifics of what changes in the genetics of dolphins and other whales have occurred in order to extend that, that premaxillary bone. Okay, thanks friends. I'll talk to you later.